I can hear you now. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you can see me, but I don't see myself. Oh, we don't see you either. We don't see you, but we can hear you. Okay, that's good. That's all you need. <laughs> um, Great. So, happy November, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to the meeting. We will get started with some announcements and introductions. So, we can just quickly go around the Zoom room and physical room and say what your name is and what ward you're a part of. And I think we should do it popcorn style. So, introduce yourself and then hand it off to someone else. So my name is Hannah King, I am in Ward 8 and I am a steering committee member and I am going to pass it off to Jonathan. My name is Jonathan Chapel Sokol and I'm in Ward 1 and I'm also a steering committee member and I'll pass it to Dave Collins. I am Dave Colley, a Ward 1 resident living on Nash Place and part of the Old East End Neighborhood Coalition. And I'll hand it off to Jonathan Farrell. Good evening, I'm Jonathan Farrell. I'm with the Committee on Temporary Shelter. We'll be talking to you briefly this evening. I'll hand it off to uh, Bob Duncan. Hi, my name's Bob Duncan. I'm sorry that my video is not showing up, but I don't know why that is. But I'm an architect from Duncan Vicenesi Architecture, and we're working on the expansion of the cost family shelter. And I'll pass it on to uh, Karen Long. Hi, my name is Karen Long, and I live on Henry Street. And I don't know who else is there. I think I saw Angie, but I don't see her name up there. I'm here. I'm Angie. So I'll pass it to Angie. I'm Angie Chapel Sokol, and I live on North Prospect Street. Great. And I hand it over to Keith Pillsbury. Um, I'm Keith Pillsbury. I live on University Terrace and I'm on the steering committee representing Ward 8. Can I pass off to Tom? Hi, I'm Tom Darenthal. I live on Nash Place, which is in Ward 1, and I will pass it off to Richard. I'm Richard Hilliard. I am your uh, Assignee to the ad hoc committee on redistricting representing Ward One. Hey everyone, Jack Hansen from the East District City Councilor. Hey, good, good evening. My name is Jane Stromberg and the Ward Eight City Councilor. Great, thank you. And then we have one last person. Who has stepped away, but when they come back, we'll intro them. Um, and then other folks are, I see Lewis and Jason. Um, Lewis, you can now talk if you'd like to say hello. Yeah, I mean, can you hear me? I'd just like to say hello. Uh, and uh, my name is Lewis Siegel, I'm in, I'm in Ward 8 on Pearl Street. And I just want to say that Jonathan Farrell, since he came on, his video is the only video that we see. So all of the other people that introduced themselves following Jonathan Farrell, we didn't see. And, and my screen has Jonathan Farrell. Hi, Jonathan. <laughs> I don't think that's the way it should be. That's interesting because my screen has David Colley. Yeah, I don't understand. Anyway, that's what I'm seeing. You know, I don't know. I don't know. For folks on Zoom, you might want to make sure you're in gallery view because that's how you get to see everybody. Um, if you're only on speaker view, you might only see one person. That's right. Thank you for that. Gallery view. Yeah. For some reason, it seems to think that Jonathan is constantly speaking, which is why it's uh, focusing on him. Okay. Um, what I could try and do, Jonathan, is, uh, or if, if you want to leave and come back, that might fix it. But otherwise, switching to gallery view might be the best bet. In galleries, if you see right in like the top right-hand corner of your screen, there's a little gray box that says view. 
with other little white boxes and if you click on that it will give you speaker gallery and then other options and if you just click gallery then you should be all right and if that doesn't make sense just raise your hand and i can like walk you through it again um but great thank you all for being here really exciting meeting um we're now going to go into speak out and so i know we have a couple folks who have reached out to us already and so um, Bob and Jonathan, if you want to kick us off with Speak Out, that would be great. Okay, so uh, do, you, do you have, uh, I believe I was told you had the drawings from our earlier presentation to show to folks? Um, uh, if, you, if you don't, it would take me a few minutes to bring that to the screen, to be screen sharing. I can check in the minutes from last month. Um, R. Johnson's going to try to see if he has them really quickly. Okay. Well, uh, while he's looking at it, I could just give a brief description. I, I don't want to take any more of your time than is necessary, but I think maybe everybody's aware that there was a little snafu with a public warning of the previous 10 k meeting we came to in September. And so there's some glitch about whether the meeting was properly warned and therefore may not meet the criteria for making a public presentation before the zoning application. So uh, the way it was resolved with zoning staff and with NPA folks was that we would make ourselves available to answer questions if people had any questions. Um, otherwise, we would probably not make much of a presentation because you folks have already seen it already. So if, if you need more than that, I'd be happy to go through the whole thing. Uh, or if you have questions, if there are people that didn't see the presentation have questions, so I can, I can answer those and we can bring things up on the screen. Does anyone have any questions for Orgy? Or Either you can indicate it by raising your hand or unmute yourself and then folks in there as well. Um, Karen, I see your hand is raised, so feel free to go. So, I was at the last meeting um, and I didn't see the presentation, so I'm not I don't I'm confused about that statement. So I don't I don't I know don't, don't know anything about it. Okay, so at the at the last NPA meeting, well excuse me, September. it may not be the last NPA meeting. It was the NPA meeting in September. Uh, I think I think it was September eighth or September 9th that we presented this and we showed all the drawings. And, uh, and it turns out that the number of letters that needed to be mailed out was was not done, and so we're on a, on a uh, warning for tonight's meeting to specifically answer questions for people who uh, may have questions about the project. So if if we uh, like I said, I'm, I, I'm conscious conscientious of your time and don't want to take up any more than is necessary. So if you but if you need us to do the presentation, if you follow those drawings, uh, I'm turning it on. You can bring them up. Uh, otherwise, it'll, it'll take me a few minutes to uh, to get to our server and bring them up. So if, if that makes sense, give me just give me a couple minutes to do that. Yeah, it was a part of the September meeting, um, not the last meeting, Karen. Right. And I'm sorry. I think I said the last meeting, but it was a September meeting. I do, I do have the images if people want to look at them. And then um, I just need to be able to share the screen. Yeah, but this is Speak Out, so. Yeah, we do have the photos, but I think if anyone has any specific questions or wants to see them, and if you just want to let us know, then we can make sure they get to you. But we do have to be conscious of the time of the meeting, I would say. Um, so if there's no other questions, I don't know if, if folks are comfortable with that. Oh, okay. So do you, do you folks see the photographs that are on the screen? Yes. Okay. So just very briefly, uh, the this is the this is the actual application that's been made to the city uh, for this project. It's a 16 unit addition to the existing Hot Family Shelter at 278 Main Street. So. The top uh, series of photos are photos of the building itself at 278 Main. The next series of photos that you see here that's labeled site context shows a building in the top left corner to the east. 
uh, those uh, actually all, all of them in the, in the top row are the building to the east. And then in the bottom row, uh, that's the photograph of the consolidated communications building uh, that's to the west. And also on the lower right-hand corner is looking to the north and that's 289 College Street, of course, access from college. The next sheet, there's some, some photos nearby Edmund School and also in the lower left, Memorial Auditorium, Consolidated Communications, uh, the building from a pedestrian view that's just east of uh, the property at 278 Main, and then a building further up the street at 300 Main. Uh, the next drawing is the site plan. Uh, so this orientation has north to the left, Main Street is along the right-hand side. The existing building, uh, if you can see my cursor, is in this location, and we're proposing an addition to it uh, that's on the north side in this location that has uh, 16 units total. Uh, there's a small amount of parking that's being provided, a total of nine spaces, broken up into two smaller lots, accessed from the same driveway, although it will be rebuilt, same driveway that serves the property now. Uh, what we're proposing to do is have a pedestrian access from the sidewalk at Main Street along the property line here that leads to a, a concrete plaza, if you will, that, uh, that forms the entrance to the addition itself. And this distinction of materials between asphalt and concrete is intended to uh, demonstrate that that's, that's a pedestrian area and any cars traveling in here uh, would be uh, consci conscious of that and traveling more slowly. Uh, the other drawings uh, that are here, I'll kind of go through them sort of quickly. Uh, this is a, a landscape plan. Uh, that calls out all the plants and trees and so on that we'll be proposing to be planted here. And on the site plan, there are two other structures that uh, there's a trash enclosure here that um, keeps the dumpsters approximately where it is now on the site. Uh, bike, uh, covered bike storage here for permanent bike storage. And this lower left-hand corner is where the electrical transformer will be. A question came up at zoning about whether that transformer makes noise and the answer is only if you're standing right next to it, not that anyone would hear it from any adjacent building or nearby building. The rest of these plans actually show the floor plans of, uh, of the basement and upper floors of the building, but I'll scroll quickly through to get to the elevations. And the uh, one thing I'll point out on this roof plan is that you'll see uh, labeled equipment here. All that is rooftop mounted equipment. And when you see the renderings, we've taken care to locate it in such a way that you don't see it from any viewpoints on the ground. These are some blow up unit plans of the apartments themselves. And then here you'll see uh, the elevations of the building. So as you, as you look at the property, uh, this is a, perhaps a, uh, a little bit confusing, but you're, you're actually looking in the lower left is what you would see from Main Street. And the center here is actually a section taken through the, uh, the addition that was built in 1991. So what you see here is, a, is brick at the main entry in this uh, portico, uh, that you enter the, the addition from. There's a third floor terrace that uh, folks who live here will be able to enjoy. And the, uh, uh, the residential parts of the building are delineated in fibrous cement lap siding. This is the elevator tower that's delineated in vertical siding. And then the circulation that sort of bifurcates the building is delineated in this uh, uh, more purple colored fiber cement panel siding. On the west elevation that you see here, this on the right-hand side is the west elevation of the current family shelter, Main Street being on your right here, and the, uh, the four-story addition at this location. Uh, the lower level is being done in large format uh, porcelain tiles, <clears throat> not to, to, uh, to mimic, but to just express a similar kind of base that the existing building has with its stone base. Uh, on the upper left here is the north elevation that you would see, <clears throat> excuse me, from the parking lot. So once again, the apartment complex is the apartment parts of the building delineated fiber cement siding. You see the entrance portico here uh, that's clad in brick. So that relates back to the original building. And then you see the circulation path here, which is the corridor in the building that's delineated in the, in the dark purple tiles. And then the base here kind of reverses itself as it steps back at the fourth floor to reduce the scale a little bit for the, uh, for the addition as it uh, fronts to the west side. The, the next views are perspective views. So this is a bird's eye view that none of us will ever see, but you can see uh, very clearly there the rooftop equipment uh, that, is, uh, that would be on the roof, but is visible only in a view like this. When you come down to a pedestrian view, looking at the driveway with the entrance to the addition here, 
none of the rooftop equipment is visible. And then this is a bit of a close up view as you're coming down the driveway of the uh, brick clad entry portico. And you see uh, this plaza here that interrupts the uh, paving, the asphalt paving. And behind it uh, is the uh, 289 College Street. And to the right is uh, 288 Main Street. And this is a corner of uh, the building at the, of the family shelter. Sorry, Bob, but we're gonna we're gonna have to wrap it up just so that way we can stay okay, on schedule. Okay, that's fine. I'll just quickly scroll through these so people can see them, and that's the end of the presentation. Great, thank you. And I can leave us on the screen if people have questions. Yeah. So if folks have questions, then do you have contact information by chance, Bob? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so contact information is uh, my my. Maybe it's easiest for me to just send you the email, or you folks have an email, you can pass it on if anybody has any questions. Yeah. Because uh, Jonathan's been communicating with me. Uh, so you have all that. So I'm happy to answer questions that way or answer questions tonight. Yeah. So if folks have questions, feel free to reach out to anyone on the steering committee and we'll make sure you can get in contact. Um, thank you both for coming in. Um, I I don't see I know Dan was supposed to come in yeah yeah he was going to but go I on. don't see him on um, so we're gonna go past that and then Jonathan do you wanna you had something right I do is um, I I'll be quick though. yeah we have a minute that's um, fine I'm this is this is from Jared Wood and it is uh, just a suggestion he he is he is is a, a comment on the um, the sur the ARPA survey how to spend $15 million. And he's not, he, he's not big on computers, so this is the way he likes to make his voice heard. Um, his recommendation is to spend $15 million toward the high school. He says we have a clear, a clear need, and we don't need to think, overthink this, and it would, help, uh, it would help the taxpayers going forward if we just spent it on something we know about. As opposed to what? Well, there's a, there's a survey. Oh. as to what are the needs of the city and what we should spend extra ARPA money on. Oh, oh okay. okay. Great, thank you. And then um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to make an announcement about? Well, I'd like to. Okay. Just, just a comment or an announcement? Uh, just speak out, so. Okay. Whatever. Um, whatever. So I also spoke to Jared and uh, he was he was exercised about the column that the mayor wrote in the latest Burlington Community North Avenue News, and reading it, I also found something that I thought was a bit not quite right. I don't understand why the mayor and the city council should be, and this is a direct quote, allocating a eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars of ARPA uh, dollars to fund recruitment and retention incentives for Burlington police officers. And that's, that was in the, uh, November the 5th. I th it seems to me that that is money that we shouldn't be incurring and it certainly shouldn't come out of the 15 million to, um, that I thought was supposed to be for the public good rather than um, compensating for missteps by the mayor and the city council 18 months ago, uh, perhaps it should come out of their budgets. Uh, let's have some accountability, and that would be my comment. Thank you. Um, we're now going to head into city council reports. So, whoever wants to kick us off, Jane, Jack, Zariah, feel free. Sorry, Matt, did we just have new people who came in introduce themselves? Yeah, so, sorry. Um, before we do that, we have some more folks who just joined us in the room. So, we just want to give quick hellos. If you want to say your name and what ward you're from, if you're comfortable with that. Okay. Um, and then, Anne, if you want to say hello to everyone. I'm Anne Varenier, Ward 8. Thank you. Kathy. Oh, and then, yeah, Kathy, sorry. Kathy Allwell, Ward 1. Great, thank you all. Now we'll go into City Council reports, so whoever wants to kick us off. I can do that. Um, 
So it's, it's nice, nice to, to be here again. <laughs> um, I wasn't here at the last NPA meeting, so uh, nice to be in this space. Um, so the fun topic of reappraisal. Um, so the council just recently passed a resolution that creates an ad hoc committee um, to hold hearings on reappraisal process in general and work with city attorney's office to explore and recommend um, changes back to the council. Um, so the CDNR, the Community Development and Neighborhood Revitalization Committee um, is going to, I believe this is happening in January. Um, sorry, my, I have a puppy and he's kind of rowdy right now. Um, they are going to uh, study the whole municipal tax system here and um, kind of propose ways we can improve the system with a focus on equity and a reduction on um, kind of the pressure on low income individuals and households in the city. So I think that that is obviously a really good thing. I'm happy that that passed. Um, I did have a few people reach out to me after that um, that resolution passed wanting to kind of understand what exactly that's gonna to do to help them, um, especially with how this reappraisal process took place and if there's any way that somehow we can kind of reduce the damage that's already kind of in play so obviously this topic is not over and this doesn't fix what is but moving forward this is good um but i do think we should keep talking about it um so moving on from the fun topic of reappraisal um we approved the 1.3 million dollars um of arpa funding speaking of arpa to help with um the unpaid electric bills um in the city for people of who have really struggled with paying those um so due, due to covid and everything obviously so that's that's a good thing i think we should be always promoting things like that especially now um, and then trying to think of anything else that's pretty pertinent. Um, we did suspend the police chief search um, for six months at least. Um, there's kind of a lot of details that go into that. I can forward a press release that was put forth by the mayor. I also am going to be putting out some comments regarding that process very shortly. So um, I'll be sure to send that to you all too. Um, and then just kind of some general rem remarks. Um, we, the COVID cases and the numbers are going up and they're projected to go up for the next four weeks. That was just released today. Um, so just be careful. You know, everyone's doing the best they can. They're really exhausted with all of this at this point. Um, and, but I just want to reiterate that as we kind of head into Thanksgiving and traveling and, and wanting to see people and, and being able to see people. Um, so, yeah, just just be careful and if you need any help finding resources on the COVID front for any reason please you know email text me um and then also one last thing a lot of the food shelves in the area are struggling like it's it's been pretty rough obviously for most organizations um, and facilities but especially food shelves um so if you have anything to spare or have any capacity to donate even a little bit especially to feeding shit and then they're trying to feed a lot of families before Thanksgiving um, and for Thanksgiving, that would be huge. Um, so yeah, I just kind of want to put that on your radar. I'm actually going to step out of this meeting shortly after. I want to kind of hear some more stuff and any back and forth and stay for questions, but I'm actually really sick right now and need to sleep as soon as I can. So um, I would love to stay, but I do need to get my rest. So apologies for my early departure this evening. Thanks. Uh, Jack Soraya, if either of you. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I can jump in next. And um, Jane reminded me that we've actually had three meetings since we all last met. I thought we had only had two, but we have had three. So kind of a lot has happened. Um, three meetings ago, the council voted um, to increase the police officer cap um, to 79, excluding the airport. So it was an increase of 11, I believe, um, from what it's been for the last uh, year plus. Um, we 
also passed an ordinance. We updated an ordinance around um, sex work in the city um, and basically decriminalized at the local level um, sex work at that meeting. Um, and we got a really awesome update from the uh, racial equity inclusion belonging department at that meeting too, that I thought was really illuminating into a lot of what they've been focusing on in their work. And they, so I would recommend watching it if, if you haven't already, but they laid out um, what is basically a racial equity strategic road, roadmap for the city and talk through, you know, the key areas where as a city we can really confront um, systemic racism and, and reduce inequities, um, racial inequities in the city. So I thought that was really powerful and they, they kind of laid out their vision for that and their plan for that and their roadmap um, that they'll lead on, but that we all will obviously play a role in. Um, I think yeah, and, and then, you know, we've been grappling a lot with uh, the issue of the encampment at, at Sears Lane in the South End. Um, there's been an encampment there for many years that people have lived in. There's probably, you know, there's been as many as maybe 30 to 50 people that live there. It's it's a bit transient, although there are folks who've been living there for, for many years as well. Um, the, the mayor chose to... Um, disband the encampment or break up the encampment. And that's somewhat underway right now, both legally and on the site itself. Um, so we've been grappling that with that in council um, and trying to really, I mean, there's we've disagreed on whether or not the camp should be broken up, but we are all, I think, working hard on, um, you know, finding stable housing for, residents of Sears Lane um, and former residents. Um, I brought forward a resolution at the last, at the second to last meeting, um, two meetings ago around transportation demand management. I've talked to you all a lot about um, policy regarding new construction with transportation demand management and sustainable transportation requirements, but this is actually a study into what a citywide system would look like for existing employers and institutions to really lean in on not just building parking lots and providing free parking, but instead, you know, using those resources to support various methods of transportation and really make it so that people are actually able to get around um, using other methods. So that's going to be a long process, but that did pass. So we'll be working on that. Um, and the mayor is going to talk about the ballot items. That's been a big focus of our work is these two ballot items coming up. Um, and I'll leave, you know, like I said, it's been three meetings, so there's a lot of other stuff. Um, maybe I'll let um, Zariah go and, and go to questions, and we may end up touching on some of the other stuff as well. Thanks. Um, yeah, I don't have a concrete plan. I think some of the things I just stopped listening to Jack at the end, so I'm not sure that if you touched on, um, but one of the things council started talking about, which Jack and I have been working on for the last year and a half is short term rentals. Um, and where that's, did you talk about that, Jack? Yeah. And where no, that no, stands, I didn't, I didn't. Okay. and where that stands, I think generally is, um, we're definitely going to allow people to rent short term within their own home, um, whether it's an apartment or a standalone house or anything along those lines, um, and probably going to allow it if the owner lives within the building. Um, and then some things that are up for debate are things like, can you, can tenants rent within the building? Um, and, um, having, and I think one of the options that we pursued very late in the game that's new is that if there's an affordable unit, which we can define to define affordable, um, then you can have for every extra affordable unit that you have in a building, can you have one short term rental. Um, so that is a debate that is happening in council and happy to go into more details on that and I can also write a front porch forum post about it. Um, yeah, the police cap 
um, I think I touched on, and I think most folks probably know how that went. And just to elaborate a little bit, the cap was 97 um, back at the beginning of the summer without the airport, um, went down to 66 um, during the summer and is now back up to 74. So 97, 66, 74, kind of the, sorry, my apologies, 79 or the numbers without the airport. Um, Jane and I, so there are 150 recommendations from CNA. Um, Jane and I both sit on the public safety committee um, that's gonna work with the police commission and then a little bit with the um, fire board. Sorry, there's just a little bit of background noise. Um, to start to implement some of the recommendations. I think folks know there was a joint committee, which was the whole police commission and the whole public safety committee, which managing 10 people can be a hard way to get things done. So I think we're gonna consolidate a little bit and start to work with representatives of the police commission instead to start to try to get the recommendations implemented. Um, and I think that's the two big things that I have, so I'll turn it over for questions. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions? You can raise your hand with the little icon or just unmute yourself. Um, Karen, I see you have your hand raised. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I had a, a question I read, I believe it was in the free press about this um, idea of suspending the police search because we need to offer more money. And it said that in order to be competitive with police departments of similar scale, we needed to raise the, right now we're at 119 to 132,000 and they want to increase it from 130 to 160,000. But the cities that they were using was Boulder, which has 106,000 people. Burlington has 42,500. And they also use Madison, Wisconsin, which has 255,000 people. So, and then there were two um, cities mentioned that they said their comparable salaries were 128,000 to 134,000. So why would Burlington, Vermont with 42,000 need to be competitive with cities that have 106,000 people or 255,000 people. So that's a question, please. I'll tackle this question, although I'll let Jane go because she's also on the search committee. Um, I know that there's different feelings in the caucus around this, but I think I think Jane may be more um, kind about what she's about to say than I am, is I was very frustrated yeah. with the mayor for like how he portrayed how this happened or he was just like, the progressives won't raise the wage. But I think essentially what happened is he tried to call an emergency meeting to raise the salary. And we said, hey, this analysis seems a little thin. Maybe this isn't an emergency meeting. Can we <laughs> talk about this with a little bit more information? Um, and so I think that we are like, I think that this is a conversation that needs to be had is how competitive we are with other cities because I think we didn't get the candidates that we wanted in the first round from, and Jane can speak more to that. Um, but yeah, I think that we're hoping to see a little bit more about what that range should be and why. Yeah, thanks, Soraya. So yeah, it's been a process that kind of went throughout the summer and into the fall. Um, and we, uh, we didn't get enough applications to make the final, like we should theoretically as Burlington, we should be able to be sifting through really good applications and just be like, oh my gosh, these are all such good candidates. How do we even kind of whittle this down, right? Ideally that's what we deserve and that's what we should really be pulling for. That was not the case with, with the applications that we got. Um, so the reason why it's suspended is honestly, that in itself is whether that's a necessity or what have you. It, I personally don't think it needs to be a suspension. I feel like we just need to keep the application process open, um, but we are just kind of putting a pin in it and reevaluating the process for which we kind of, I guess, took part in 
to get us to this point and how to like redo that and fine tune it. Um, but I do think that, um, I do think we, we'd use Boulder and we use Madison a lot for a lot of different things, which is interesting that you brought that up because those are, that's really good points. And that's kind of what my reasoning was when I first said, oh, I kind of want to hold off on raising the salary, but um, was very open to it um, kind of as the weeks went by, as I saw, you know, there weren't as many applications, maybe that would be a good thing to, to do. Um, but I personally think it's more time than money. I feel like the just the, the window of time for which applications can come in needs to be longer rather than go back and forth with the difference of, you know, 15,000 or something in the salary. Um, so yeah, you bring up good points. Those are larger cities. Um, I think we use them as examples because they kind of have, those are cities, especially Madison, um, kind of looking at more of a, uh, in general, kind of holistic and restorative process for how they, you know, function in society. I feel like they are something that we try to emulate in some ways. Um, so definitely kind of looking at that, but I, to look at that for an actual number for a salary, I don't think is a fair comparison. So I think you bring up a really good point, Karen, with that. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, Karen. I don't think that analysis was compelling at all for raising the cap. And if we're gonna spend an extra, if the, if the intention of raising the salary of the police chief is to get a good candidate, I, I'd rather spend the extra 30,000 on getting like an expert recruiter and, and hiring up on the recruitment side to specifically target cities that have done transformative public safety and try to recruit and really, you know, headhunt a candidate who has strong experience leading transformative change. I think that's what we should be focusing on. So I think it's it's a distraction um, from what we should really be doing here. And I'm I'm really frustrated at the process so far. And it's definitely something that I want to work on going forward is not to just sort of accept this narrative of the administration and just accept that we're gonna continue to indefinitely delay. I think we need to move forward much more strongly on getting someone at the helm of our police department who is on board with transformational change to public safety. Okay, um, we have a couple hands in the room. So we'll go Keith and Tom. Yeah, Keith and Tom, yeah. Um, I guess this is addressed to all of our city councilors. I mentioned, I heard uh, Zariah's talk about um, Airbnbs having, that can, be, can exist if the owner is in the, on the property. Many of us live next to rental properties that owners live out of state. And they are very hard to contact and they have property managers that are out of, out of the uh, city also. What are you, what is the process now? What is going on about uh, working with the University of Vermont to provide more housing for its coming, it, its gra undergraduate students. They seem to be t a, um, admitting more students to the university and we, the neighbors, are having to pick up the extra stress of having those students in our neighborhood. Um, I don't know if Jack wants to take this, but we are renegotiating, I think, part of how how many students UVM houses. And I think therefore we're, I'm not sure how much we're allowed to talk about it, but I think we're pushing in that renegotiation for it to be higher than it has been historically. Yeah, we're actively, I mean, actively is a weird word. We had an executive session recently in council about UVM building more housing, which is, I think the first, since I've been on council, the first serious, um, discussion that we've had executive or public as a full council on it. So I can't really speak to it because it is executive, but we are discussing it actively, which again, I, I think is the first time in a, in a little while that that's been the case. So you know where I stand on it, Keith, I hope. I mean, I, I completely agree that, that UVM needs to build more housing and needs that housing to be um, priced, you know, more in line with the market. I don't want them to use housing as a mechanism to bring in income. And that we need an enforcement mechanism for any housing that they do promise or percentage of students housed that they promise. 
that there's some teeth behind behind that. Right, because we don't want them to just, and you've talked about this, Keith, as much as anyone, like it's one thing for them to build more housing, but if they're gonna just build more housing and then just grow by that same amount, it's not gonna have that impact. So it ha there has to be teeth to the percentage, like Soraya said. I just wanted to question regarding the police chief's search. Is it possible that there aren't applicants because it's uh, not seen as a desirable position and that one of the ways to make it more desirable is to increase the salary? And isn't the mayor already um, requesting that professional recruitment um, organization be recruited to help with that effort? Um, Jack, uh, or I'll, I'll go, sorry. Yeah, right. sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I do think that I, I'm not saying that I don't think it makes sense to increase the salary. I'm saying that I don't think we did much of an analysis of what it should be. Um, I think that the analysis that we did get was weak. I didn't think that it justified having an emergency meeting on it. Um, and then two, the speaking for increasing the salaries, I think generally the city has been increasing salaries for all of the directors. So I think even just looking at parity within the city, like if I look at that, then it makes sense to me to increase the salary. So I think the only thing I've ever said on the issue is like, let's look at more numbers um, and have a conversation about it. Um, I do think that Burlington is going to be a uniquely difficult place for a new police chief. Like, I don't think that there is any way to say it other than that. And I think making it, and I, and I think that that could deter a lot of candidates. And I think it might hopefully also encourage one or two of the right candidates. So I think that it's a conversation about salary. Um, and it's also a conversation about, yeah, who we're, who we're recruiting. Yeah, I, I mean, the, as Karen pointed out, like the analysis itself, not only was the analysis thin, but I think the analysis itself showed that we're actually in a fine place. The only city that was in the analysis that had similar population to Burlington had like, it was like 128 was the salary and we're, we're going up to 131. So yeah, I'm open to like seeing more cities in a stronger comparison analysis, but right now I don't see any compelling argument to raise it. Um, in terms of the second piece, I, yeah, I mean, I think most people who've been in policing for a long time, who have a lot of experience in policing and have, you know, served in leadership roles in policing are embedded to some extent in, in the current system of policing and have been successful in that system and gain their experience in that system. And so it is a tricky, you know, it's tricky and there's less folks if we are, if Burlington remains committed to this type of transformation to public safety, it's going to be a smaller pool inherently because there's not people who are committed to traditional policing probably aren't going to want to be in the role if that's where the city's going. But that's why I was saying earlier is if we specifically target and search out um, people that do have experience with transform transformative change to public safety and with alternative models like the ones that we're talking about. So that's where I think the focus should be. The last question will be from Tom. Yeah, hi. I, I guess my question is just a sort of a logistics one and that's given that we have an acting police chief, how long can we go before we actually do damage? Um, to our police force in our city. Can we go for six months? Can we go for a year? Um, how, uh, you know, is this something we should really have filled by January? Um, what do you think? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I personally think that, yeah, we haven't had a permanent police chief in a while. And I think that that 
isn't great. I think six months is a long time. That is half a year. Like that's a long time to just kind of put a pin in a process without any real hard reasoning. So ideally it doesn't last six months and ideally we kind of figure something out. Um, honestly, I'm, this is like a, a literal active item of, of like, where do we go from here? Um, because you're absolutely right. Like where, where do you draw the line? I personally have never been in this position before where um, there's a committee that's kind of cr created and this is really intense but important process and then all of a sudden it stops for no true reason. It's just kind of like an artificial deadline that was put in place. So um, hopefully we can work around that and figure something out. Um, just administration and the council and just figure something out because you're right, this is not a permanent fix and um, the city deserves answers as to the direction and where we're gonna go from here because, you know, why have a com police committee search for a police chief if we're just kind of going to, like, it's almost as if it didn't exist, you know? So it's like, well, all of that work couldn't have been for nothing. And, and it wasn't, I mean, we, we did learn a lot in that process. So we do need to pick the parts that are useful and, and move forward with that and figure, figure out the, a, a process around kind of that and how to fix that. Um, so hopefully it, it's not six months long because I agree that is, that's a long time. Like I'm not gonna sugarcoat it and I'm not happy with it. Yeah, I mean, to be clear that, that sorry, is right, did you wanna go? Go ahead. Just that wasn't council hasn't weighed in on that, and I don't I don't agree with that at all in terms of delaying it. I think I think we should be working, continue working hard to find this person and recruit along the lines that I said. So, I it's a weird there's a weird power um, struggle issue because the mayor does appoint, you know, the mayor has the sole ability to appoint department heads. So I don't know how this is going to play out in terms of the division of power, but I certainly think that we need to keep going and I don't agree that we should wait. Um, and just the last thing, sorry, Hannah, I know that we always have, Jack and Jane and I sometimes have three different opinions. Um, I think that the question, well, when I see was rhetorical, like what the actual endpoint was before we start doing um, damage. And I think the other, just from an organizational development kind of standpoint and um, like what it means to have like ambiguity when you're in an organization about like what leadership is, which I think is probably the kind of worst term that we have looking at it like from the standpoint of the, you know, folks in the police department. Um, I'm hoping that some of that is just because we put off the search so long um, already just with COVID um, because all of this, you know, the many transitions in the police department happened at the start of COVID. And so I, from the conversations that I've had with people in the police department is I feel like people in the department, you know, trust the acting chief. And I think that there's, as, and I think that there's some consistency in that and how long he's been there. So I'm, not sure that internally there's that much harm being done because there is some stability in that. Um, but clearly I think the faster we can wrap up the process, the less uncertainty there is for the police department, the better it'll be for the police department itself. I don't know if that was more of what you were asking, but that was what I heard. Okay. Uh, thank you, counselors. Now we are going to head into school board. Kathy, if you have any updates. Okay, well, I guess most of you know that we made the decision to stay on Institute Road and the south side of Institute Road we've chosen for the next site to be checked out. Certainly, they have to do a lot of boring, et cetera, to make sure that they're, the soils are all okay. It, but it will be in front of the old school down on, on North Avenue where the bus turnaround is and part of the parking lot will also be used and it'll be both the tech center and, and the high school. And you know, they're just, we're just starting 
you know, to start designing, et cetera, for that site. So how much this is going to cost, we don't know yet. We have already started getting things ready because besides asking the taxpayers for money, we are also going out to look further afield and to also really ask donors to, you know, give money to this because I, you know, we don't think that it's possible to go for the whole two buildings. I mean, it's one building, but it's the equivalent of the tech center and, and the high school that we're going to be putting on a ballot. And so it's, it's not going to be cheap. And I think everybody knows that. So we are looking in all sorts of places to get these funds together. Um, we also just um, signed a three-year contract with the superintendent for another three years, which we were all happy that he wanted to stay. We wanted him to stay, so that's good. Um, and the, other, the only other thing really going on, which isn't small, but it is the weighted study that has been going on in the legislature, which really has a lot for us as Burlington and Winooski and other cities that have high poverty and high ESL students. And so at the moment there is a legislative committee that is, that is, or task force actually, that has been looking into this. And we, Burlington, Winooski, and other cities or in towns across the state have organized into a coalition that are going at this as one group because we realize for 20 years we've been underfunded in this district and we, the leg we pushed to get the legislature to study this, the waiting, which was brought, done by UVM, Rutgers, and American Institute of Educational Research. The legislature paid over $100,000, I think it was, to have this thing done. And now they're tearing it apart. And they're wanting to pull ESL students out of it, pay for those with categorical aid, which I personally find extremely racist given the makeup of our ESL population. And they're also trying to do something by pulling poverty out of that weight, it's out of the weights as well. We in the coalition are pushing very heavily for them to use the study as it is and don't muck with it. But, you know, we'll have to see what the legislature does. At the moment, I'm not too happy with where they're going because it doesn't sound equitable and it doesn't look equitable, but. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do, we have time for one quick question. So, Jonathan. Thank you, Kathy, what can we do to help? Well, we, we are going to, and I keep saying this, we are actually going to organize that people here in Burlington start talking to legislatures, both ours in Chittenden County, but also those that are, you know, on this committee that have proposing this that we find outrageous. We need to talk to them too, because they need to understand that this is not okay. And we have been dealing with it, not only Burlington, but Winooski and all these other towns and cities, Rutland, I don't know, I, I could list them off, but there's a bunch of them. For 20 years, we've been underweighted and we've all, and it's, you know, it's taking its toll, we're seeing that. And 
yet nobody has the civil courage to go out and say to their taxpayers in these overweighted districts that they're going to have to pay more taxes for the same education that they're giving their kids right now. So, I mean, we have Act 60, which brings the money in equally, and then when we delve it out to the school districts, it becomes unequal again. So we're, you know, we love to say that Act 60, and it is probably one of the most, you know, equitable school funding laws in the country, at least it was when it was enacted. But we don't look any different than any other state because it certainly is inequitable how the money is given out and the difference in what some of these schools look like in some of these very small rural areas. I mean, it's sad. It's really sad to see how they cannot fix up their buildings. They don't have the money. They keep cutting stuff. It, I mean, really, when you look at it, we're as bad as many of those states that we would never want to put Vermont in, you know, compared to. So. Great. Thank you. Um, I want to be mindful of the time because we're already behind schedule. So I think we're going to go to the mayor's presentation now, if you are ready. There we go. I thought I hit the mute button. Good evening, everyone. You're able to hear me all right? Yes. 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 All right, excellent. Um, uh, very nice to see everyone. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk for a few minutes about the two ballot items that um, are uh, before you in a special election that is has begun and uh, which will remain open until December 7th. If you have been an active Burlington voter in recent years, you should have received a ballot already. If you haven't, um, the, you should get in touch with City Hall. And there's a number of ways you can go on our website and find out how to request a ballot. You can call City Hall. Um, uh, there's a number of reasons why you might not have received a ballot and we can get that straightened out quickly. If you haven't registered yet, you can of course register right up uh, to and including um, election day. Um, there, there are two items. One is about item number one is a, um, a general obligation bond for city infrastructure and ballot item number two is a Burlington Electric Department revenue bond that um, we are calling the net zero energy revenue bond because this is a key step forward, um, uh, represents really a key communal decision um, if we want to meet the very ambitious local climate goals that we've laid out for ourselves. This, uh, this bond is perhaps the single uh, 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 most important decision we face over the next decade to try to meet those goals. So I'm gonna, I've got a PowerPoint for each of these and um, I'm gonna start with the, the general obligation bond, if I can get it pulled up correctly, here we go. And Hannah, we have about 20 minutes, is that right? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll try to get this, try to get through these uh, quickly so that we can um, have time for uh, questions. Um, here we go. Bear with me just one more moment. All right. All right, everyone seeing that okay? Yeah. Here, here are the, if you're gonna kind of take home three things uh, about this, uh, to know um, from my perspective about this $40 million uh, capital infrastructure plan uh, bond uh, before you, um, he, he, here's where I would focus. This, this proposal um, has been, it, it is, the, is, is a fiscally responsible long plan continuation um, of the last five years of major overdue investment in our public infrastructure. Hopefully you have noticed that since 2016, when um, almost 80% of voters voted for the sustainable infrastructure plan, um, we have done a great deal of investment in our roads, in our bike path, in our sidewalks, 
in our fire engines um, and, and to some degree in our, our city buildings. And this is a continuation of that effort. That the, the bond is largely focused on that key infrastructure. Um, there are, in addition to what I just listed, there, there are important bike and pedestrian improvements that are part of this. Um, one difference between this bond and last time is there's a, a significant dollars, about $4 million that will be invested in public safety communications equipment. Um, uh, so, uh, but the, 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 a great deal of the money is going in, again into what I think everyone thinks of as roads, sidewalks, parks, um, core infrastructure. There is a cost to this. There's no way around that. Um, uh, I do, as people are ma making their decisions um, uh, about, uh, about the cost, and I know this comes um, after uh, what has for many people been a painful reassessment and um, I know there's rightly concerns about property tax uh, burden in general. The cost of this bond may be less uh, than you think. The, we can have this very substantial continued investment in this core public infrastructure for an additional cost when fully drawn down several years from now uh, of about $13 a month um, for the median homeowner. Um, further, uh, this... Uh, important, important to know about that cost is this, uh, this is the mat last major general obligation bond that the city, and I'm making a distinction here between the city and the school district, and I know there's some questions about that, and we'll speak to that later in this presentation. This, uh, uh, this is the last major bond uh, the city plans for the foreseeable future, and after, after this bond, we get to a point where we are retiring a significant amount of debt on an annual basis and um, we'll be in a kind of stabilized level where we can continue to invest our infrastructure at a higher level than we've done historically, which is important because we weren't investing enough, but there will not be mounting growing uh, costs to property taxpayers. So those are the big picture points. Let me quickly go through some additional details. Um, So this, uh, I won't go into uh, every line here. This is just a reminder that this, this effort goes all the way back to 2014 when we committed to uh, drafting a capital plan for the first time. Um, some, and we went through a great deal of process it, back in those years. We've gone through quite a bit of process this time as well. It's been quieter perhaps process. I know and some, some people have said to me they felt like this sort of came up out of nowhere. Um, virtually every commission in the city has reviewed this plan in recent months um, and endorsed it. Um, and the city council uh, uh, gave this a strong support as well, the, by almost unanimous 10 to 1 um, support, including, I believe, uh, all the councilors who um, are participating in this call uh, supported this effort. Just really quickly, again, I won't go into every one of these uh, highlights, but um, it, I think I'm uh, I think it's important to reflect back a little bit on, on what did we do with the first uh, $27 million bond? Well, we, we really changed the trajectory of our sidewalks. We basically tripled the amount of annual sidewalk investment that we uh, had, uh, had been doing, um, which was critical because we were only replacing um, uh, about 1% of the sidewalks a year before that, replacing 3 to 4% if you can sustain it for a, a long period of time is a sustainable um, level of annual investment. Um, we put substantial efforts into our streets as well, doubling the amount going into our streets. The bike path is hopefully you've all experienced and enjoyed has been virtually completely rebuilt. The, the final mile is being rebuilt now down in Oak Ledge Park. If you haven't been down there recently, you should go check it out. It's pretty exciting. Um, <laughs> Why, why are we back for, for another? And why is it important that this happen now? Why, why are we doing this uh, special election? The, there's a number of reasons for that. Um, the, a, a major one to me is uh, bullet point four there. We, we are essentially a year behind schedule in this effort already. The pandemic uh, like impacted this effort like everything else. The initial plan had been to seek um, voter support for a second bond in 2020. And um, as a result, we've already been through one year of uh, 
uh, considerably uh, lowered investment um, than we had been doing. Um, by voting now in December and in November and December, um, we have the opportunity to have to get back and have a very productive 2022 construction season. Whereas if this is pushed back to, to town meeting day um, because of bonding requirements, bidding requirements and whatnot, uh, we, it will impact and we'll have a second pretty um, uh, less active um, investment season in a row. Um, further, we are in a period of some uncertainty. And I know that cuts both ways. I know the economic uncertainty we're, we're in, in some ways, cut weighs on some voters' minds. Uh, a, um, a positive element um, uh, of the current environment that we don't have a guarantee will continue is that we continue to have historically low um, interest rates right now. Uh, and um, by approving this now, we can lock in uh, those rates. Um, for at least a major percentage of this $40 million bond um, in, in the near future. The um, other, uh, you know, I won't go through every bullet point, but you can see there's some other, other elements that drove our collective decision as to why to come forward now as well. Um, We I talked a little bit at the top about what this money is going into. And instead of focusing on this slide, uh, I'll go, let's go straight to, to the numbers here. Here's how our, here's our projected breakdown. Um, I, I think it is important to note, this is a, a projection. This is an estimate. The actual uh, investments happen on, on an annual basis through the appropriation process with the city council. But we, you know, we, we are always very mindful of, of course, of, uh, how we talk about these uh, efforts with the voters. And um, uh, this is the basic um, uh, roadmap, the plan uh, for how this $40 million would be invested. We're going to continue to have this enhanced level of street and sidewalk funding. We do have city IT needs that we have traditionally paid for out of bonds. And there's a piece of that here as well. Bike, it, bike infrastructure and intersection improvements. And what, what it's not, sometimes it's not obvious to me, what do we mean by intersection improvements? So uh, a good example that I think uh, people have seen the real value of is down by Shy Guy Gelato, that complicated five-way intersection. We had a uh, kind of uh, a quick build uh, test a few summers ago. And then um, I think last summer, maybe it was two summers ago now, we came through and rebuilt uh, all the curbs and really made that a much safer, um, clear, more clear to navigate intersection for cars and pedestrians alike. Um, that, that is an example of, a, of an intersection improvement that improves um, pedestrian safety in a, in a material way. One in uh, your ward that um, is uh, planned for the, the, the near future and that this, this bond would go to is the intersection between um, uh, Pearl Street and, Pro and, and Prospect Street, that kind of complicated, um, somewat dangerous intersection will, will be improved if we're able to continue, if we have the funding to continue this work. Uh, local match for grants, uh, this is a big thing uh, on Monday. The city council approved, for example, um, a one and a half million dollar design contract for us to move forward at full speed with the rail yard enterprise project. This, this uh, project that would connect Battery Street to, to Pine Street. These are a great deal for the city. We get essential public infrastructure and the state and federal government pays for 90% of this work. But the, there is a local match that we need to pay. We need, we need a local match there. We need a local match on the Shelburne Rotary that we're building currently. The Champlain Parkway is actually going to get built, and we need a local match there. Um, uh, so the, these, these dollars leverage tens of millions of, of other dollars to invest in our community. Uh, there are bridge projects. Believe it or not, the city of Burlington has more bridges than you would think. There are uh, a couple bridges on the bike path that we're responsible for that need significant investment. Um, there's the one that connects to Rock Point is the city's responsibility. The, the, the bridge uh, over the entrance to North Beach needs to be replaced. Um, civic buildings, you know, uh, I know some of you are down there at the library. We have significant um, investment needs at the library. We have, we have uh, 25 major buildings and about 40 lesser structures that the city is responsible for. Many of them have been underinvested in uh, for a long period of time. And uh, if what we do, if we 
having this kind of bonding allows us to, to proactively do that work as opposed to, uh, as has too been often been the case in the management of city assets in the past, just deal with things when they break, which ends up being more expensive. There's more parks investments. There's more investments in fire trucks. Um, the public safety infrastructure is that communication system I mentioned before. And then finally, there is $10 million reserved for Memorial Auditorium here. This first and foremost, what this funding would allow is us to ensure that Memorial Auditorium um, maintains stru structural integrity and does not fall down. I don't want to be the mayor that after decades of neglect um, uh, sees the building actually become uh, lost. And that is hanging in the balance now if we're not able to make significant investment in it. That, that will be only be two, three million dollars. There will not be more investment in the building until we really have a, 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 a more full plan. We have not as many, as you know, we don't have a, a full plan for what we're gonna do with the building in the medium and long, long term. Um, that will be something uh, that we will be working on and finalizing and the city council would, would sign off on, on further investment in. I'm gonna try to, this, uh, I can come back and talk more about this if there's questions about it. The point of this complicated graph is that the $40 million that we're asking voters support to support would help leverage about over $100 million of other investments in, inf in infrastructure through these various programs. So we are not just coming to, to property taxpayers um, for, for all of the help here. We have worked hard and, and are working hard and will continue to work hard to line up a variety of other sources as well. Um, I won't get into the details of this, uh, of this slide, but I, I show it to further reinforce the point that a lot of planning and thought has gone into the amount of debt that the city is taking on and that the school district um, and city together can take on. We've had since 2018, the first ever debt management policy for the city of Burlington. And we are borrowing at levels that uh, ensure that we, um, uh, that, that are in line with what Moody says is appropriate levels of borrowing for us to maintain our, our AA rating that we've collectively worked so hard for over the last uh, decade and, and made such progress on. A further point here that um, is actually kind of captured in this graph, although it takes a lot of words to explain, but is that more than half of the bonding capacity is being reserved for the school district uh, to, to pursue their uh, infrastructure needs and that there is substantial additional capacity that remains um, beyond the $70 million for the new high school that the voters have already authorized that will remain, um, uh, uh, that is being planned for and that, that will rem remain uh, re regardless of whether this bond passes or not. Um, I'm a big, uh, you know, I've got two girls going through the system, one daughter in high school right now. I, I fully share. Kathy and the school school board's um, sense of priority that that the this the, the new high school um, is incredibly important for this community and that we we need to get it done and um, I'm looking forward to to supporting that effort um, from in every way I can. Um, this just uh, lays out the uh, the the costs uh, again in a in a multi year projection. That is the presentation for the general obligation bond. Um, let me just really quickly shift to the revenue bond and then I'll take questions. Um, huh. um, Huh, I thought some, somehow I've lost this sort of summary slide that was here. So you know what, let me just, in the interest of time, just say, here's, here's maybe all that you need to know about the, the revenue bond. If you, if you like all of the, the administration and the entire city council believes that it is really important for Burlington to do its, its share for addressing the climate emergency, and do everything we can to meet the very ambitious goals we have of becoming a net zero energy city by 2030. This bond is a key step. Uh, this is gonna allow us to address both sides of that equation. It allows us to uh, invest in the infrastructure that's necessary to, um, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, make the city work um, on, a, 
when it, when our, our cars and our uh, heating systems have, have been electrified, it, it, it allows for millions of dollars investment in that infrastructure. It also will allow us to continue um, the green stimulus incentives that have made it possible for hundreds of Burlingtonians um, to shift from gas burning heating systems and, 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 and vehicles to uh, electric vehicles and cold climate heat pumps in recent years. It allows us to continue those green stimulus incentives for at least the next three years. Um, another key thing to consider as you're weighing this is this is the unusual bond that will have no impact on your property taxes. It's a revenue bond. Um, it also will have uh, essentially no impact on your electric rates for at least five years. And then very modest, um, like uh, maybe 1% a year impact on electric rates uh, it, it, for, for years five and beyond uh, with conservative projections. So this is really one of those rare times where you can kind of vote your values, vote to make progress on the climate emergency and do it um, confident that uh, it's not going to break the bank. It's not going to have a, a a major impact on your household budget. Why don't I stop there and take any questions that there are about uh, either of these initiatives? Okay, so folks, you can raise your hand on Zoom and for anyone in the room, you can raise your hand as well. We're very short on time, so be mindful of that, please. Um, so any questions? I know Tom, you had your hand raised and then we'll go to Karen and then everyone else I can put in speaking order after. Hi, Mayor, uh, I got a quick question about the borrow the, the city's ability to borrow money and keep our uh, our rating it looked like the target was one and three quarter percent and, and we exceed that in a few years that includes a small amount of money to replace the high school i mean my back the envelope calculation is that a new high school will cost about 300 million dollars and and you have maybe 70 million in the spreadsheet um are we going to get in trouble Great, thanks, Tom. Um, so, the, the that is a good close read uh, of, of of some of that spreadsheet. And you are right. the The target um, for the municipal borrowing is between one point seven five and a maximum of uh, two percent of our the full value of our grant list. And we have. The way our, man, our debt management policy was written, it says if we're going to exceed that 1.75 um, lower end of the target, we need to have a plan to get back. We shouldn't go over to and we should get back under it, uh, have a plan to get back under it. And what those projections show is that we're estimating a two to three year period of time where we're uh, above the you know, we're, we're in that 1.75 to two range. And then it goes back uh, below 1.75. The city council made a special finding um, of, of that plan when this was approved. And so those actions are consistent with uh, the way this the debt management policy is written and that Moody, Moody's have reviewed. And I will say um, Moody's just came out with a kind of update as they do on an annual basis of their view of Burlington. And they, they affirmed, they reaffirmed our AA rating and they specifically noted the way um, that there was an expectation that we would be taking on more debt um, uh, and um, uh, that, that was expected and they were, were comfortable with it. That said, I mean, to the second part of your question, um, a $300 million high school uh, all paid for by bonding would, would be a problem with staying within, uh, with those, um, within those limits. Uh, I, I, certainly I will say from my conversations with Superintendent Flanagan, I think that is a number well above where uh, he is hoping this com comes in and at um, the, I, I would not agree with your characterization that that spreadsheet has um, just a little bit amount of money for, for the new high school. It includes the $70 million that was already approved plus um, tens of millions of dollars additional beyond that. Um, it's really up to the school district, I think, to lead the conversation about where they expect this cost to come in. And uh, certainly, uh, you know, the whole point of creating this uh, policy um, is so that we are mindful about it as we are making our borrowing decisions. And so uh, I, I do think this will be part of the discussion about how much 
uh, borrowing is um, appropriate for the new high school. Um, and basically to boil it all down, you can be confident that more than half of the total capacity is being reserved uh, for um, the school district under this policy and that there is substantial additional capacity for a new high school beyond the $70 million that has already been approved. To get into more detailed numbers than that, I think it's really the district has to lead that discussion. Okay. Okay, we'll go to Karen, then Erhard, and then I think that will be all of our questions for tonight. Thank you. Karen. Hi. Um, so my understanding, I think, is that 70 million that we approved was for renovating the high school, not building a new high school. So I feel like there's going to be, I'm sure, more bonds that will be required. And that's what I wanted to ask Kathy before, um, because I I love to ride my bike and the bike path is great and all that, but we need a high school. like. I don't care about any of those other things anymore right now. Like we should be focusing on how we're gonna get this high school up as quickly as possible. And as far as taxes, you're saying a median price, it's gonna be $13. Well, the reappraisal has really uh, increased my taxes like 40% because I don't know, Mr. Vickery thinks my house is worth really a lot of money and you really are driving. I'm a senior now and you are driving families out. Maybe not you personally, but the, this whole reappraisal, I know young families that cannot pay their taxes. Um, and Mr. Vickery went to each NPA and really downplayed that, oh, you know, don't worry, we're not going to be affected. Well, we, I am personally affected and I know many, many other people who are personally affected. So, I don't think you get that, um, how we have to be more careful with what we're doing. And um, I'm against the, you wanna increase the police thing. You are comparing it to Madison, which has 255,000 people. We have 42,000 people. So that, and that's a whole different thing, but I really, um, I think that we need to just, rethink this because, and also even doing a special election. I know that costs a lot of money there and we could have waited till March. March is only a few more weeks, months away. So I just think that, um, I don't know. I feel like you're just trying to price people out of Burlington, Vermont. So um, Karen, I, I um... So there are elements of what you said that I, I fully agree with. I, I think Burlingtonians pay way too much in, in property taxes. There's no doubt about that. Um, the municipal investments are not the, the, the driver uh, of the dramatic run up in, in property taxes uh, over recent decades. Um, if you, uh, the, the, what is driving the uh, tax burden is a broken statewide uh, education financing system. Uh, in just a little bit more than the time I've been mayor, we have gone um, from a situation where 40% of the property tax, over 40% of the property tax on an annual basis went to the city to a place where only about 30% goes to the city. The city has been very restrained in its budgets. Um, uh, certainly throughout the decade that I've been responsible for it, we have kept the cost of uh, the general pr property taxes for uh, the operations of government um, underneath, well under below the, the rate of in, in inflation. Uh, the other major driver of why home valuations went up so much is that we just simply don't build enough housing. We have a huge supply issue in terms of housing in, in Burlington. And, you know, you and I have been on the uh, opposite sides of uh, many past debates about the importance of housing. Um, uh, it is I, far more than anything about municipal spending. It is opposition to the creation of new housing that is driving this huge run up uh, of uh, valuations and the scarcity of housing. So uh, I, I, I've been stood to, for fighting against that in every way I know how. Um, I don't think there's any, uh, with the possible accession of a new high school, I don't think there's much else that's more important, I guess, and climate change. I don't, I don't think there's much else that's more important than 
addressing our, our housing uh, supply shortage. And we're gonna, this is a conversation that's gonna continue um, in the months ahead. The city is gonna be doubling down on its uh, efforts to address the housing supply crisis and to end functionally end homelessness. And um, I, there are many reasons that I hope the public will support that effort. Um, one of them should be concerns about property taxes going up. If we had the right amount of new investment in housing happening uh, on an annual basis, uh, that would have bring a lot of uh, relief to the run-up of housing prices, and it would also uh, divide these costs, municipal costs, over a, a bigger tax base. So uh, I stand by my record of, of turning the city's finances around, of, of creating a a double A rated city going from the edge of junk bond status. We've been very um, responsible and uh, careful about your dollars and our efforts to do that. I think infrastructure is important. And when every time we've talked to voters, they've, they've said infrastructure is important too. So that's why we're bringing this forward again. I hope you'll support it again uh, if you want to continue the, the turnaround that we've succeeded with over the last five years with the city's infrastructure. Hi, um, and we're really short on time, Erhard, so just keeping that in mind. Uh, thanks, uh, Mayor. Thanks for the presentation. I uh, hope you're doing well tonight. Um, so my question, and I fully support the uh, need for the city to invest in its infrastructure. You're absolutely right. It's always been a struggle to find the money for these kinds of things, and we have large needs, including the high school. Um, but I'm just wondering, given the fact that the um, that Congress just passed uh, this big infrastructure package, and hopefully there's there's more to come um, through Build Back Better, um, have and I know it's recent, but have um, your staff been able to do any kind of analysis to what extent some of the money in in the bipartisan bill that just passed um, can be used for some of the things uh, on the list? Hey, Erhard, I'd love it if we got a memo from uh, your team telling us uh, exactly how to understand this huge bill. Um, we are digging into it. Um, uh, it. You know, it certainly represents substantial opportunity for, uh, for the city. And the city council was really clear in the resolution here. If we end up doing better, we have assumed in that big complicated spreadsheet yeah. I had up there, we have assumed some federal infrastructure investment um, uh, in this $150 million plus total plan for the, the coming years. If we do better than that, those assumptions, um, the, the council is really clear that, you know, they, they may, uh, that, that we'll take further council action. We're, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna, there are guardrails on the resolution that we're not gonna spend the local money if we, if we don't need to, to accomplish these goals. Great. Well, um, we'll, we'll I will say, to I to help you with gonna, that. I think it's going to a little bit, maybe I'm curious your take on this, Erhard, from your perspective, working for the Senator. I actually think having strong local uh, flexible dollars may actually allow us to do substantially better in the competition that's going to go on out there for these federal dollars. I mean, already we have uh, deadlines coming up in the next few weeks for applying for some of these competitive funds and having local matching funds, having shovel ready projects. I think is going to put us in position to do really well competing for these dollars in the coming years. No, I, I, I think there's wisdom in that. Um, I, I think it's still early. You know, we're, and I'm not the expert on the bipartisan bill. I've been focusing on build back better and the housing investments that are, that are going to hopefully go into that when it hopefully finally passes. Um, so, you know, I think it's still early to know exactly how it will filter out to municipalities. You know, we've, we've seen, we've got numbers for, you know, what we expect to, the state to receive, but it, it hasn't been broken down to the granular level of, you know, how much Burlington might, might expect. So looking forward to working with your team on, uh, on that. And, um, it's, it's an exciting part. It's a, these are hard times, but that's an exciting part about what's going on right now to have a real partner in the federal government for un unlike uh, anything I've experienced over yeah. the last decade. It's really exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. I think we're going to wrap up, but thank you for coming in. Thank you, everyone. Nice to see everybody. Great. Now we're going to go into our redistricting discussion. So I don't know who wants to kick us off. And then, Keith, I have your presentation when you're ready. I'll start by uh, 
saying that uh, Anne and I are listeners and gathering public input, and Keith has gone to a lot of work, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to put a presentation together, and I would uh, leave the floor to Keith, be my recommendation. Okay with that? Yeah. Sure. Is that all you're going to... Well, I've got a couple of other things, but uh, I'd like, like to go through some timelines and, and uh, re record that there's a, another public meeting next Wednesday. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, and there's also another public meeting December 6th, so two more yeah. public meetings, and we're hoping a survey, although that seems to be delayed. Um, see a survey and the community news of the December the 3rd. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. So, yes, uh, the two public meetings, which are going to be hybrid meetings, um, again, are uh, uh, November 17th, which is a Wednesday, and December 6th, which is a Monday. Um, I think those were the, the main messages that we wanted to get out. The only other one that I would add is the city attorney um, spoke to the public meeting last Monday. That's Monday, the whatever it was, first, I think, um, and s said that it's the time frame as it stands at the moment makes it most likely that we won't see an election uh, with the new boundaries, whatever they are, until. Uh, town meeting day on in 2024 and if anyone wants me to go through that give me a call or email me I'm sorry I just wanted to clarify that so um, so the the actual vote on whatever redistricting plan we come up with I believe we're voting on that November 2022 yes. yeah. okay so it's not going to be this town meeting day that's, that's right, it would be 2024 when we'd actually see them in effect. Well, it'll be implemented, okay. Yes. Okay, Keith, do you want? Yeah, do you have my chart? Yeah, I just got it. I'm currently the ward clerk for Ward 8. I, I started out when Ward 8 started existence in March of 19, or March, 2015. I came from Ward 1 where I uh, was asked to be a volunteer and when they needed me. They didn't always need me because they had a, a real oil machine there or they had people who did it every year. They, they spent the whole day there so they really didn't need help. When we started off in Ward 8, it was really different. Uh, first of all, we uh, didn't have a, a, a a pool of people who were available for that for election day to be able to spend the whole day um, uh, doing the work that the, that the people that, that I'm used to doing in Ward 1. They, it, they saw it as exhausting, they saw it as something that, or they, they were working, they didn't have the day off, so um, we didn't have the availability of uh, people to do this, so we had to really go to a big uh, uh, push to get people to come in for a couple of hours uh, to do this, and uh, we had to convince the city that the state would allow us to have anybody from the city of Vermont, uh, city of Burlington, to be a uh, volunteer, to be a, an assistant election worker in Ward 8. You don't have to be a Ward 8 resident. That was our first thing to overcome. Our second thing was to get a space that allowed us to be able to operate uh, as you know, as I was used to in Ward 1, because we, because we often have people who show up, well now we have people who show up and they need space to, uh, to register, um, same day registration, uh, but that's not the only thing that our people have to do, uh, our constituents have to do. Most of them will uh, get a card, I don't know if you're familiar with those, I wasn't in Ward 1 because we didn't do that, but oftentimes they get a card that says they need to tell the board of, uh, reg voter registration, they need some information. So we'd have, we'd have our constituents coming to the checklist and we'd always send them back. And we, so we've really square, we've had to have more volunteers to, to uh, kind of go through that with them when they first enter the, uh, the, vote, the, the polling place to make sure that they're on the checklist, that they're at the right, 
at the right place. Um, oftentimes they're not. Oftentimes uh, they uh, need to go to another place. Oftentimes they're not registered, so we have to take care of that. Oftentimes they're challenged, that is they need to give further information. Um, just to give you an example, um, we, we all, um, those of us who are regular voters have received a, a mail-in ballot and um, so, did, so did all the constituents in Ward 8. But 1,850 of those mail-in ballots came back with addressee unknown. And uh, Ward 1 had 1,500 right behind us. So I think some of the larger wards are the, some of the wards where some of our larger student populations uh, are uh, de dealing with the fact that either the student has left the ward or left the area, whatever. So uh, those are some of the things that I, that I come to. Uh, it, it's just really hard to explain uh, how different we are and how it feels that we are um, having to have you know up to 20 volunteers to take care of uh, making sure that our students are met in a friendly manner, that we get the help they need, get the information, get we get information we need for them so they can get uh, checked off on the list and then uh, get their ballot and, and then show them how to put it into the uh, voting machine. Uh, so what you have here is the uh, kind of comparison between Ward 8, um, their, the registered voters, and they're not all that much different from the uh, average of wards one, uh, wards one through seven. Uh, we're probably a little bit lower, but not that much lower. And this is the, the real, since um, the number of, uh, of our voters who you know, did not, uh, or whose ballot came back, indicates that a lot of the names on our checklist are people who are no longer living in our ward. I don't know if they're living in another place in the city or if they're out of the state, but that's one of the uh, situations that we have in Ward 1 because as uh, Gene Bergman said about his ward, Ward 3, uh, we're a transitional ward. People come and go and because a majority of our students, uh, 4,250 live on campus in Ward 8 you can see that um, we do have a large number of students that um, are not engaged in, our, in the voting in our ward. And some of the things that I heard at the last input meeting, I thought, were not true about students. Um, and I'm not going to go into why I think they're not engaged or uh, other things, but I can just tell you anecdotes of my campaigning door to door. So I sort of tried to compare the number the number of votes that we had in each one of the elections from March 3rd, 2015 to just the past one, March 2nd, 2021. Now, I wasn't originally gonna put in the primary ones in August, but I decided you should see the, uh, like the uh, primary in August 9th, 2016, um, Ward 8 had 285. The August 14th, uh, did I say 2016? The August 14, 2018, we had 188. I suspect that's the basis, uh, the base or the core of our voters. That's kind of the number of voters who are regu irregular, they're maybe long-term residents of the ward, whatever. I put that in there just to show um, th that the numbers fluctuate. We never know how many we're going to get um, from vote from election to election. We also are the ward that registers the most number of voters. Uh, and um, in 2018, we registered over 500 new voters. And it's not unusual for us to register between two and 300 new voters each time we have an election. So that's, that's, that involves a lot more volunteers, a lot more working, uh, helping the students understand what they're doing and making sure they don't put their home address out of state, but they're, they're Burlington residents so that, that they, they become a Burlington voter. Are there, I'm not, 
I'm not really gonna give my interpretation of what I see here, but I, I, I think it shows that we don't have the engagement of the student population that people were desiring. Um, and, I, and I can just give you my experience from going door to door. Many of the students say, I vote at, I vote at home. Uh, in 2016 uh, and in 2020, when I thought, even on my street, I would go around and ask, you know, let the students know where they could vote and blah, blah, blah. And nobody said they were gonna vote in Burlington. They wanted to vote in their home state. They thought their, their vote would have more weight there than in Vermont. And uh, we have on our street, we have 11 reg um, registered voters who are um, owners, of prop owners of homes or long-term renters. The other 50, uh, 50 to 60 uh, residents on our street are students and if three or four vote, that would be unusual. That is just my street. I, and I think the numbers here show you that other, other pockets in the, in the community that makes up Ward 1, you see the same kind of thing. Um, so that's, does anybody have any questions about this chart before I go on? I have some other comments. How much time did it take you to put that chart together? Well, first of all, I, this is all public knowledge or public information on the, um, on, on the city clerks, but I wasn't sure that they were always accurate, so I went to the tabulator that we work as, uh, we work at it at Ward. At seven o'clock, we have to run the tabulator uh, strips, and we have to make sure that the number of, number of voters that we've checked off equals the number of ballots in this machine. Now, um, working with people that come in for a couple of hours that, and then leave and somebody else take over, and at the beginning meant that we had some we had some slip ups. We were off a couple of votes and we couldn't find out. And who knows? When you're working with volunteers, you don't know, especially if they're coming in new and they haven't really been trained or done it before. You know, and like in Ward One, the ladies sitting at the checklist, they do it you do it for the twelve hours, they've done it for years and um, so there it, I found it was more accurate, although we did have to find all of the write-ins and make sure that our write-in number um, was the same as the number came to the same number people checked off. We oftentimes in our checklist have more pages of new voters that day than we have pages with a voter checked off. Okay, that's the situation in this board, okay? Um, I think I saw, is, does Lewis have their hand raised? I can't see anything else on my screen. What's that? Uh, Lewis has yes. their hand raised, if you want to promote them. Okay, I just, I'll just go through some of my notes. I jotted down some thoughts. Uh, at, our last, at our last vote, we had 229 new voters we registered that day. That was a town meeting day. Um, it was the election for mayor, so there was some excitement. And we, we had a total of 837 votes cast in Ward 8. It was the lowest number of votes cast in all, of all the wards, uh, 20, almost 21%. Actually, Ward 1, which also has a high number of, of students in it, they're not all that much higher than we are. And they actually bring down the average for the, from the wards like Ward 4 and Ward 5, which have high percentages of their people voting. Uh, probably less, less renters, less uh, people are moving in and out of the, those areas. Um, I, ex I also explained that we, have the, we usually have the largest, well, we've only done it twice. We've had the largest number of mail back ballots um, that the postman says there's the addressee is unknown. Um, as school commissioner, I used to go and uh, I, was, I was invited to the Student Government Association at UVM monthly and we would talk and um, 
I could tell that uh, they enjoyed uh, asking questions about the school district and getting information. But when it came to uh, getting signatures for people because they, I, I needed to get on the ballot, there were only two out of the 50 that were actually registered in, in, in Burlington. And uh, when I went last night to, to, uh, to beg for volunteers for the Ward 8, um, I need volunteers for Ward 8 election on December 7th. I only, I put out many, many things. I've gotten four names. I got, I got a good number. Now we'll see if they'll actually be able to do it. And um, one of the comments, they, basically the comments that they told me were, they, they wanted to be more engaged, but they really, they didn't have that energy. The activists were. It's very clear that there is a group of people who are activists uh, who want to get, want to get registered, want to vote and get involved. But a lot of um, other students are not that committed to voting in Burlington. They, they have more loyalty to wherever they come from. And that was clear to me last night. Um, so that was, some, that was some of the survey information that I've picked up so far. Um, Okay, the, um, our, our ward, uh, when we, when we, uh, the worst time for our, for our election officials is when we vote uh, in legislative districts. And our ward has three legislative districts as well as Ward 1. But our legislative districts are so convoluted that somebody on one side of the street is in one legislative district and the other side of the street is in another legislative district. And um, it's very hard to explain to, to students which legislative district they're in. So we have to, you have to use all kinds of tricks. Use the map, kind of use this. And oftentimes the information we've been given by the city or the university isn't as accurate as it needs to be. So we've had to uh, deal with that. And, um, I think one of the advantages that we've had is that I, I know the district so well that I can tell a student where they are, even if uh, somebody who's uh, trying to help them, it gives them the wrong information. And then we have, a, have to have a discussion about which is, the, which is uh, the district they're in. Oftentimes they think they're in a, even when they're told they're in a district, their name isn't on the checklist. It's because they moved and they registered in another district. So we have to have them, to, we have another list, another pile of, of uh, change of address. That's another. We are at 838, just. What? We, it's 838 right now. So, so how much time do I have more? I don't, I don't know, I guess I could talk forever on this, but basically what I'm saying is that for, for, a, uh, for a city council, uh, ward, this, this ward takes a lot of work and we're not getting a lot of the engagement I think people thought they were getting with students being in it. And um, I feel like, you, so is that all you want me to say? I, I thought I came prepared to say a lot more, but that's okay. Let me ask you a question. So why the fact you, uh, that Ward 8 has such a difficult time finding people to vote and finding people to work at the polls. So what is the city of Burlington doing to help you conduct your poll? So is the city, is the city clerk's office giving you extra assistance? They, they will send us people, I, I don't know how to say this, they will they'll let everybody know we need them, but they don't necessarily send us the most helpful people. So that's why I've develop my own group of people, sort of com camaraderie. It, they know the situation. They give me, I mean, like I sent in five names yesterday like we were supposed to, and Lori knows that I'm gonna be having to send in some of the last, sometimes the day after the election, because I can get students to come at the last minute. And Lewis has their hand raised.
I just I just wanted to say I I don't get the point. What what are we trying to do? Are we trying to make students that live in Ward Eight more engaged in local politics and become voters? Or what what is the objective here? That's a good question. My I don't you know. My job is to make sure that we run a, a, uh, an election that is uh, secure and everyone, ha everyone uh, gets an opportunity to vote who is qualified to vote. And uh, that's, that's what the, that's what the uh, ward clerk does. Lewis, can I s um, try and answer that as well, if I may? Um, yeah. so, so the city attorney's presentation uh, will show guidelines for 2010 redistricting. Uh, I won't go through them all. You, you know everything that's wrong. Uh, and one of the uh, first recommendations that the ad hoc committee will be giving to uh, the city council is to adhere to the guidelines for 2010, uh, and the result of that will be, or should be, that the sort of dysfunctional, or dysfunction that Keith is describing uh, is, I won't say it's eradicated, but it's spread out among a number of different wards, and I can't, I don't know how that's going to work out. Um, because we're not drawing boundaries, we're just taking public comments. Uh, but so it that, could I just, should I just say, does that translate into a redistricting that is I can only say that we hope so, and that will be the strongest possible recommendation. Okay. I vote for it. We'll see. <laughs> um, any final questions, comments in the last couple of minutes? I have a, I have a question. So, uh, is the steering committee for wards one and eight? Are they interested in ever making a like? basically promoting some sort of resolution to the city council as to whether or not wards one and eight MPA are interested in maintaining ward eight or if ward eight should be removed and the city should go back to a different number of wards based on what uh, Mr. what Keith is saying, Mr. Pilder. Well, I think what our role is to get feedback and that feedback is going to be tabulated and presented to the city council. Um, I don't know that we're going to actually make specific recommendations um, for to present to the city council ourselves, reflecting our own personal opinions. If so, if so, I, I, would, I would agree with Anne, but I would also say that if something is clearly dysfunctional, that there's I don't see any reason not to mention it to your city councillor um, because they're going to have to make some decisions. Um, and we would like them to know, I think, that the sort of uh, situation that Keith describes is, is prevalent. And uh, I think Sandy Wynn said in the meeting uh, last Monday, the public meeting that we held in Consoys, <coughs> She said it was intellectually challenged, and I think that that's correct. Okay. Um, so I, we only have a minute or so left before we have to clear out. So, um, Jonathan, if you want to do the raffle.
I'm pulling. Pull out two. One. I hope you will read what I wrote. Because if Kathy, Kathy has one one. And then Angie. Kathy and Angie are our winners. How exciting. Neighbors. <laughs> Um, well, thank you all so much for coming tonight. I know that Keith put together this presentation, so if anyone wants to read it or see it, reach out and we'll make sure that you get a copy, um, as well as all the other presentations. And it was great seeing you all, and we will see you next month. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, Donna. Local board? Oh, okay. It's a one-year subscription.